So welcome everybody um, to this learning event addressing the need for foster care in the context of the um, Ukraine crisis. Uh, my name is Florence Martin. I'm the executive director of Better Care Network, um, and we're thrilled to have you with us today um, for this learning event. Next slide, please. So first of all, to say that uh, the meeting has simultaneous interpretation available in Ukrainian. Um, so we ask you, first of all, to make sure that you're in the right language channel. If you need interpretation in Ukrainian, uh, please go to the little button um, at the bottom of the screen as uh, this shows and uh, choose Ukrainian. Um, otherwise, um, choose English. Um, as always with meetings, and we have a lot of actors, a lot of participants, which is very exciting today. We have a lot of uh, fantastic presentation. So we ask that, first of all, you keep yourself on mute. Um, if you have any question, please use the chat. We will be monitoring the chat. That's where to put your questions. During the Q&A, when we get to that stage uh, in the event, uh, please raise your hand if you have a, uh, a question uh, or a recommendation. Um, we also have a jam board and Selena is going to share the link uh, in the chat right now. Um, and the jam board is really, we would like to use it uh, with you to um, identify for comments, for recommendations, um, things that are actually not already, uh, uh, not questions, questions are in the chat, but things that you want to add to what's being said or recommendation that you want to make based on what's being said. Um, Selena is showing how to add. If you haven't used Jamboard, there's a little sticky note uh, that you can use and you can write in it. We have a Jamboard the, uh, for uh, both parts of the learning event. So we have a Jamboard around uh, the first part, which is going to be looking at the foster care system in Ukraine specifically. And then for the second part of the event, which my colleague um, Kelly is going to moderate, which is looking at the host countries where Ukrainian children um, allocated and the foster care system there. Um, so please find the link in the Jamboard. Um, the other thing to say um, is um, what is the purpose of the event? So as you've seen from the invitation, um, we were really keen, and this is talking to many of you, to work together on identifying concrete recommendation to address the current gaps, the needs, the challenges around the provision of foster care, both in Ukraine in the context of the current uh, uh, crisis, but also in, host, in some of the host countries that are hosting uh, uh, Ukrainian refugee children. Um, we want to understand better what foster care looks like in all of these countries, particularly in the current situation, but also the impact that it is um, that the crisis is having on the foster care system more generally. And we want to identify together some of the recommendation about what is needed to strengthen the system, what is needed to address uh, those challenges. Um, and uh, uh, what, uh, how do we actually ensure that both immediately, but also in the longer term, we ensure that family-based care is available for children who need alternative care. So that is very much the purpose of this event. As mentioned, we're starting with, in our agenda, a session that is focused specifically, going, we're going to have a presentation around the situation of children in foster care in Ukraine uh, and understanding what that looks like including the challenges and the gaps and also the solution. Um, and the second part, we will be looking specifically at the situation of Ukrainian refugee children in need of foster care or in foster care in Poland, Moldova and Romania. And we have some amazing experts from those countries to help us understand and provide their recommendation. Then we will uh, move to a conclusion and wrap up. Um, now we want to acknowledge this is going to be a very packed event. There's a lot of uh, important learning and information. So we're going to manage time, but we also recognize that this is the beginning of a conversation. We need to understand far better how foster care is happening or not happening in the context of the Ukrainian crisis and what we can do to strengthen that both immediately and longer term. So that's the agenda and the purpose of um, this meeting, this learning event. Um, we will now move on. Uh, it's, uh, first of all, my great pleasure with the first session to introduce our first speaker. 
Vesilinia Di Bialo, I knew I would not say that properly, so apologies, Vesilinia, uh, from Partnership for Every Child Ukraine, who will speak to us about the situation for children in foster care in Ukraine, including the challenges, the gaps, and the solution. Vesilinia, please, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you for introduction. I am very pleased and thankful for Better Care Network and all the partners who have initiated this event and this discussion. And I am quite aware that this will be the first probably attempt to discuss and describe. And I will do my best to uh, talk about everything we face now in Ukraine in this uh, 10 or 12 minutes uh, delegated. So Partnership Every Child is Ukrainian charity working in Ukraine since 1998. And our focus and our mission since the beginning of our work was to uh, establish and to ensure the right of, uh, of child for the family. And with the same mission, we continue during the war. We still think that the children should be cared for in the family, even despite of the uh, war situation, conflict, armed conflict, and all the crisis which, which is uh, happening in, in Ukraine now. Uh, thus, uh, uh, now we will, I will tell about uh, just some, some probably notions. When we talk about foster care in Ukraine, we should understand, and I, I see a lot of colleagues who work in Ukraine, uh, who have experience and probably know this information, but just for, for others. In fact, we have um, four types of family-based alternative care in Ukraine, which would, which would correspond to classical model of foster care, um, I would say, but describing different types. So we have guardianship families. This is the biggest number. Usually uh, one, two uh, children are placed. Uh, in a lot of cases, it is uh, kinship care, but we also have a very, uh, very different mixture. For example, we can have a guardian, uh, guardian, uh, uh, guardianship family who has 15 children with no uh, kinship relations. Uh, family type children homes, uh, it's up to children can be placed. This is usually for family groups placements. But again, we, in practice, we have children like 15, uh, 12, nine children, so different, different number of children. Foster family, up to four children, but the average placement is one, two children. And in some reports done by international social services, foster families in Ukraine were recognized like a hidden adoption, yes, that because usually, uh, usually uh, children are placed until uh, 18 years old. And recently introduced in, uh, in fact, it started, we started to pilot it as Partnership for Every Child in, 19, in 2009, but into the system, it was introduced in uh, 2017, the short-term fostering, which is called in Ukraine patron, not family. An average is two, three children per case per family for a short time period placed. So uh, you can, uh, on the next slide, you can see the number of uh, children and data which uh, we had before the war started. Yes, before the February 24. I will not name uh, these, these numbers now. You can, you can have a look. But the biggest number was uh, children was placed in guardianship care. But we didn't have information, baseline information, how many uh, these families, how many guardians. And this is one of the challenges, one of the gaps, which is now very uh, crucial, in, especially in the war period. Then we also have children placed in um, family time, children homes, foster families, and short-term foster. So what should be noticed about the legislation framework, uh, which is also important during this war, war time, is that all children who are placed in this family type cares, they are, they should have so-called status, status deprived of parental care. So they should be considered next, it's on the next slide. Uh, it, they should be considered as children orphans or children deprived of parental care. So in fact, children are placed under full legal representation of the foster cares, which means that they in fact, uh, do and act as a parent. Yes, they have all the legal rights of the parents. And um, uh, that, uh, that's why they, they have probably less support, uh, less social support as it is in uh, some uh, other, other countries, uh, uh, which we, we learned from, from experience. And uh, from a small exception is for short-term fostering. They bear some legal representation um, uh, duties, but not all, yes. 
and uh, all these types of uh, fostering for family family type placements they are considered uh, they are funded from the central budget but at the same time they are not considered as a professional service they, they the funding are through allowances yes yeah? through allowances for children and allowances for parents and also parents have some other type of social benefits so uh, partnership next slides and we started to work at the first uh, day of the war uh, our um, uh, huge um, family of every child uh, partnership for every child regional alliance started to provide us support from the first day and from the february 25 we launched child and family support program and managed to work with uh, 1799 alternative care families uh, on the next month, so starting from the end of March, uh, next slide, uh, we have started the project supported by UNICEF, which is called Children in Alternative Care During the War Monitoring Project. And it uh, covers all regions of Ukraine and monitoring of all forms of, of alternative care. All the four which I mentioned for family-based and also residential care. So the now, now the main issue uh, could be okay what happens yes with the with the family-based cares during the war so the main conclusion and result it would be on the next slide please uh, would is that um we have some data uh, some number and um, uh, you can see on the next slide uh, where they are so children stay the main result is that the 80 percent of children from family-based it's on the next slide uh from family-based uh kia they stayed so they didn't move uh any uh, they have not been displayed and this is very important because these children and these families they also need support now um, not only those who have been displaced within ukraine or evacuated abroad and on the presentation on the next two slides you can see uh, more specific data you can then look on the numbers but mainly uh, i am dividing them on these four types and where they are yes stayed in the territories moved abroad within ukraine or we don't have especially data uh, for some guardian uh, guardians we don't have enough enough data now and the next next one is showing the by the distribution by the regions of ukraine yes how many in fact so if you have a look on the oblast which are very uh, which are suffering now yes from shilling it's Kharkiv, Sume. You can have you you can see that 90 percent 70 percent of family based care children in these families stay in these territories so they are still under danger so they still need some support and then finally uh as um, time is running much quicker than i expect i will come back to some probably a uh, generalized or maybe some main main needs and uh, challenges and recommendations which we have found out so if we have a look on these different types of where the where the families and children are now so if to speak about families and children who stay in the place of living yes uh, what they do what they need yes uh, financial support especially for those who cannot receive state social benefits there are such families which physically cannot receive because of different reasons not connected with the with their with them yes uh, the houses are damaged. This is cases, for example, from Kharkiv, Sumy Oblast. Uh, these families and children need to be included as beneficiaries of humanitarian aid, even though they are not IDPs, even though they are not internally displaced, because they also have uh, suffering, uh, suffered from, from the war. Uh, social workers for case management and permanent, not ad hoc support, are very much needed. Because these families need someone to to uh, to call, someone to uh, ask for advice, someone to ask for a system. Yes, for example, even what to do with the social benefits, and also this is work of social because psychological support and counseling. This is what is very much needed, but it's less the least requested. And in some cases, we also find out that psychiatric support and access to psychiatric services are also needed. And the, recently, because September, the school has started in Ukraine, gadgets and laptops for distance education is, is, is a huge uh, priority now and a huge request, especially on the regions, in the regions uh, like Kharkiv, Sumy, Chernihiv, uh, Mykolaiv, Zaporizhia, where uh, 
the schools have not been opened yes for, for the uh, for visits and uh, those who stayed in the place of Limin, which are now occupied territories it's uh, mainly Kherson Oblast Donetsk Luhansk uh, part of the Zaporizhzhia and part of the of the um, uh, Kharkiv region of course they mean financial support or some type of evacuation assistance and what are they now requesting uh, the most we get request it's preparation for winter and this is mostly request from uh, Kharkon Sersonska Oblast. Next slide, please. If you talk about uh, family, foster families, family type children homes displaced within Ukraine, uh, basic living needs are now provided by government, local government, uh, central government, and a huge number of non-governmental organization, charitable organization are providing different type of assistance. But longer term solutions for those families whose houses are ruined, damaged, or there is no possibility to return. Uh, again, this is connected uh, with the oblasts which are now occupied, uh, should be now uh, developed and also supported. Again, social workers, uh, in fact, social workforce and social workers are needed in for all the groups, yes, for all the types of, um, uh, of the families. Psychological support and again, gadget and laptops. And evacuated abroad. I, I don't, I will not stop uh, a lot here because we will hear, uh, I think, a lot of challenges from our colleagues. But uh, what we face in our work that families and children need point of preference and assign social worker in Ukraine to establish contact and relations with um, and support which they can need. Legal support services, because we have uh, already a lot of cases of uh, when children have been. Uh, taken from the family based from foster uh, parents uh, placed in other type of placements in the country for example Italy Germany Portugal Poland uh, in all these countries we have the cases when children have been separated but they lack some type of legal assistance and the liaison with local authorities in those countries and we uh, during July we already had 25 cases of uh, families coming back from um, from abroad, and we have more requests for support and preparation for this coming coming back. And I I think uh, uh, some of the recommendations uh, which we can I think discuss during during the uh, our further meeting that um, this is probably not not all yes this is um, there is huge number of recommendations which could be about education, medical uh, access, and etc. But some of the main which we think are, are important to start is to upgrade some existing databases for better provision of baseline information. Uh, we think that we need uh, taking into account all the problems which we have with family type children homes abroad. Um, the, the family, all these types should be somehow revised and regulated and bring into uh, a li in line with them uh, UN guidelines on alternative care. Uh, a lot of funding and financing are needed for all these needs of reconstruction, rebuilding, renovation, expansion of social services, uh, revise of the size of the benefits because of due to the like very um, decrease in inflation and economic situation, uh, the benefits which are now the families getting, they are now very quite low and the increase in number of community social workers and so social workers who can follow up and support the family. And not very probably exactly about family-based care, but review the procedure for, for adoption and placement during the wartime. It's now being done, it's in the process in Ukraine in order to, uh, to make the process smoother and easier, but also to make sure that safety and preparedness of the family is uh, checked. Uh, I think I, I will stop here. And um, if any question, there are some contact information and we can uh, go to the um, questions. Thank you, Vasilinia. That was really uh, packed and really informative. Um, before we go to the question, um, I'd also like to give an opportunity for Galina Bulat from Lumos. Um, also uh, expert in Ukraine uh, to talk a little bit and comment uh, and add um, to the really important information that the Selenia shared. Galina, over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, 
as uh, alumnus, we are, are glad to participate and uh, contribute to events like this uh, that uh, help us uh, to learn more, but also help uh, the wider community of colleagues uh, and the communities we are working uh, for. And I wanted to say special thanks to Vasilina for the very consistent presentation for comprehensive uh, findings and uh, recommendations. Uh, we, uh, as an uh, organization that supports Ukrainian uh, authorities in the implementation of care reform, uh, have uh, some knowledge and experience uh, in the alternative care sector, including in foster care. We uh, supported uh, the authorities in uh, one uh, oblast in the Zhitome region to carry out the needs assessment uh, at the regional level and in uh, 54 uh, communities and to design the development of support services for children and families at risk, uh, including the creation of uh, foster families. In the beginning uh, of the war, we uh, supported regional authorities to um, create, to, to establish a few uh, foster families for the emergency placement of uh, uh, orphans and uh, children deprived of parental care who remained in uh, residential institutions after the uh, disposal of the Ministry of Social Policy uh, to return to their families all the uh, institutionalized uh, children. Uh, currently, uh, all foster families in the region are given humanitarian aid from uh, LUMOS. Uh, recently, we have uh, also conducted a survey uh, with uh, foster parents following uh, their uh, training on the provision of uh, psychosocial support uh, uh, delivered by LUMOS. Uh, and the, the purpose of the survey was to understand how the skills and the knowledge are being uh, used. Uh, and we are happy to say that preliminary results revealed positive feedback from parents and the children. Generally, uh, the survey uh, shows that we are on the right track and uh, we are planning to use the survey to adjust our interventions, uh, including training, but uh, also in a wider context of uh, care reform in Jutomer and uh, at the country level. I wanted also to uh, point out that um, LUMOS has experience from around the world as well, uh, working on uh, interventions uh, with uh, displaced and uh, refugee populations in emergencies uh, in Ethiopia, in uh, Haiti and um, other uh, locations. Uh, we uh, also uh, have a series of reports on uh, uh, trafficking in and out of institutions uh, where there is no uh, strong uh, government uh, oversight. Our reports confirmed that uh, uh, serious uh, exploitation and trafficking take place in uh, European children's uh, institutions, uh, including in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, currently we uh, still hear about uh, children uh, being moved outside of Ukraine uh, without uh, the necessary safeguards in place and in uh, contravention of uh, international and national standards. And for sure, this uh, continues to be a, a significant uh, concern for all of us. Going forward, uh, LUMOS is uh, actively involved in uh, many discussions around the care sector. However, we uh, are conscious that this is not enough. And we think it is important to start acting in a more uh, focused and uh, concrete way. We uh, propose to call on the government to create a working group uh, under the Ministry of Social Policy, uh, comprised of uh, public and non-public experts and organizations, uh, in order to develop a, a dedicated uh, foster care national plan based on the recommendations uh, made by all of us in this group. Actions can include, um, as uh, Vasilina mentioned, the needs assessment, uh, training, the information campaigns, uh, specific benefits for uh, foster families and others. Uh, this plan should become a part of the national uh, care reform agenda of the current uh, um, discussed and uh, implemented recovery programs and has to be funded from the funds allocated uh, for this uh, purpose. 
the Ministry of Social Policy should lead the process and we as uh, partners uh, should help it. We can allocate our experts in the working groups or uh, we can propose to the ministry to create a special unit which will support the ministry for a short term. LUMOS has experience in supporting ministries, the Children's Ombudsman Office and the other agencies with uh, technical uh, consultants and we can uh, contribute uh, this time uh, too. Uh, we would be happy to partner with others for, for sure to participate and if needed to facilitate the first uh, steps in, uh, in this initiative. Uh, in our views, uh, in this way, we will ensure a tangible support to the government. If not, we will continue to discuss, to make recommendations and residential institution, uh, institutions will continue to prosper because there are no alternatives available to replace them. Thank you, that is all. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, a few reports, I will put the, the links in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Galina, that's very helpful. And it's uh, useful to have your recommendation and hear about this proposal to have this working group. Um, we have uh, time uh, for some Q&A. Um, and uh, any questions that you have, I see there's already a couple of comments in the jam boards, uh, but I'm not seeing any questions yet, but uh, I certainly have one. Uh, and I, I, I'd like to ask both Vasilina and, and Galina, if I may. Um, you, you mentioned, I mean, clearly there are, there are different types of foster care, including uh, types of what sounds like residential care, which is being called foster care with a family type, but it's, uh, the question that I'm still a bit unclear, you also mentioned that the uh, the basis for placement needs to be a termination of parental rights decision. Now, in the context of the current conflict, how are, how are these decisions being made, bearing in mind the the, uh, the lack of information, the, 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 the difficulty, I would imagine, to actually uh, uh, confirm the whereabouts of, of uh, parents and caregivers in the in the context of displacement, and how is that impacting uh, the placement of children, particularly in in emergency foster care um, or in family based alternative? Uh, I can answer because uh, there is very clear answer in Ukraine. So, uh, for only for short term fostering, which is called patronat in Ukraine you can place children which still don't have the status yet, which are vulnerable. And uh, current statistic before the war was that uh, up to half of the children have been then returned to biological families, yes. In all other forms, you should place only those who are deprived of parental care uh, rights, yes, their parents. In terms of the war and the um, and situation now, uh, the government uh, use, uh, if we call it the Article 31 uh, in some of the regulation, which is about temporary replacement of children in the families of Ukrainian citizens. So it's widening. So in, in general, this regulation allows additional placement of children in the existing foster families, family type children, guardianship, without making allocations, uh, allowances, payments, yes, but as additional family placement in until the martial law is in force. And in, in addition, uh, this, this regulation allows to place in other, in other families. This is also one of the components which I didn't mention, but which we are huge work, we do huge work on this. Uh, our government president office, they run the chatbot, uh, which is called uh, Child Not Alone. And uh, up to 8,000 Ukrainians registered that they are ready for this temporary replacement. Yeah, now in all regions of Ukraine, we are doing the training, like express training. Yes, just it's not a, it's online, it's several sessions but just to prepare uh, these families. And we have already trained uh, 1,800 just citizens, uh, families of citizens of Ukraine, where could be placed uh, children who temporarily left and whose situation is not clear and will not be clear even, for example, in three months or six months because the parents um, are not known where they are. Are they alive or they, are they uh, taken forcibly somewhere to Russia uh, or other uh, non-governmental controlled areas? 
So this is uh, this is this possibility that this can be placed. But the the issue is that uh, the, they lack because, if, for example, we just recently had a, a case with Odessa. They wanted to place three children, and uh, people cannot receive three children because of financial reason. Yes, you need to feed, you need to close, and this is not paid. This temporary replacement is not paid by the uh, by the government. So that's why we also are helping and fundraising for, for example, to help such families to pay them some um, smaller benefits, but in order to support them in this uh, very good initiative, because this is a chance for, for children to be placed in families. Thank you so much for this comprehensive answer, uh, Veselina. Galina, did you want to add anything to this question? No, uh, it was uh, indeed comprehensive and exhaustive, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Very helpful. I see there's a, a couple of questions in the chat, um, and one that, that uh, directly relates to this from Dragana. Um, first of all, you know, thanking you for the comprehensive information, but also asking, can you share um, how many of the children that are in, in this foster care system are children with disabilities? Do you have data? Do you, do you have information about that? Uh, we have data, and I would be happy to share, but I cannot uh, tell it right now. Uh, okay, I see that. Different type of data on, on this, uh, um, and would be happy to share later, uh, probably. And Wonderful. I see Philip was also asking. Uh, it'd be great to to uh, if you can actually share the data, the sources of the information as well, so people can actually really uh, get to understand and and deepen their understanding of the data. But in relation to children with disabilities, um, you are seeing children with disabilities in foster placement, both emergency and. Uh, a guardianship placement as well, or are they primarily put into into the family type? No, we have children with disability in all these four types. Uh, we have very difficult cases which we were uh, managing. For example, we have guardianship family from Kherson moving with three children on wheelchairs. Uh, they moved and uh, partnership every child. Moldova, I think, helped us because they moved uh, uh, to uh, Moldova, then to Italy, then some other countries. So uh, we have in all, and we have children with autism, we have children with um, Down syndrome in family type children homes. And this is also type of, and for example, some family type children homes, which have children with psychiatric uh, diagnosis, they lack, this is the most requested um, families, this families request most the support to be returned back because they cannot find the proper uh, proper services um, as they used in Ukraine. So this is um, some of the challenges that children with disabilities, they, they face bigger challenges than those children who moved without disabilities. Thank you. Um, I see as well uh, a question um, from Susanna. Um, is there interest at the government level to start child protection reform in Ukraine? Either Galina or, or Vesilina. Galina, do you want to give a first stab to that? Yeah, I, I can. Um, I would say that uh, there is a ongoing reform for uh, the last, I don't know, 10, 12 or 20 years. Uh, uh, there are ups and downs, uh, there are uh, some um, appropriate decisions, uh, governmental decisions, I, I think I, uh, uh, I'm talking about, there are uh, appropriate, there were appropriate uh, strategies, action plans. However, uh, from time to time, uh, some uh, uh, political decisions are taken that uh, are not uh, helping this reform and then not uh, supporting the reform. Uh, in our uh, opinion, we, uh, we as a, a community have to um, start uh, a new, uh, another discussion around the uh, child protection and care reform, uh, because uh, as uh, was mentioned, there are gaps and we have to go through the reform uh, by approaching these gaps, uh, having uh, ground as a ground uh, uh, solid uh, strategies and plans and all this as I mentioned uh, uh, we think uh, should be a part or elements of uh, this uh, very wide uh, recovery uh, programs and uh, plans. 
it is a lot to be uh, said in this regard because the reform uh, is happening, but um, still is not aligned in, uh, on all uh, uh, its elements with the international standards and the best uh, practice. For example, uh, in terms of uh, children with disabilities, uh, because uh, as I know, the Ukrainian legislation do, does not um, uh, contain specific uh, provisions on uh, foster care for children with disabilities or for uh, young children and the other such uh, gaps exist. But not only this, uh, there are a lot to, to, be, to be done. And uh, we have a, a large, a wide area of action in this regard. Thank you, Galina. I but can, I can mm -hmm. just a short, uh, very, very quick add that I would say that partly some part of the government is very interested. And for example, the new Minister of Social Policy again declared that they are in, in full supporting the institutionalization reform and the priority should be given to family type care uh, in Ukraine. At the same time, on the same week, the Ministry of Education is issuing another decree or another regulation which foster placement children, especially with special education needs in institution. So this is a very difficult question uh, concerning Ukraine. Uh, another uh, case, another issue that, for example, um, Partnership for Every Child is a member of Ukrainian Child Rights Network, and Ukrainian Child Rights Network is now lobbying also and advocating for even uh, justice reform, and we work with another type of ministries because even uh, some uh, decision about adoption, some procedures, some court decision needs to be ch changed immediately in order to foster this child care reform. And this is also done, and this part of the government is also willing to cooperate. So it depends in Ukraine a lot, but still there are cases when even now during the war time, we facing when new institutions are being created and even being supported by funders, by private funders. And this is the most dangerous uh, which could happen during the war time. Thank you, Vasilina. It's very clear. We need to uh, move on to our next um, session, but I see there are a couple of uh, other really important questions. Um, maybe I, I will very quickly, if we can get a very quick answer, put uh, Shoshan's question to you. Um, because it relates to what we're discussing. The number of children in temporary or short-term foster care are still very small. Is this primarily because of lack of financial allowance to parents or are there other policy roadblocks to using temporary foster care more widely? Uh, this small number is because the, the, this uh, type of fostering started to be developed recently during the next three, uh, last three years. And uh, um, it's not very easy, in fact, to recruit uh, short-term uh, fostering because this is more professional service. They pass a huge number uh, of hours of training. Uh, they are paid, and uh, this is a bit different uh, from um, like long, longer-term fostering, uh, which is more uh, more usual for, for Ukrainian society. And uh, in, in my opinion and, and our organization opinion, we don't think that we need to push because sometimes we also run too quickly in some directions, which is not also benefiting for children. So this is developing. And of course, uh, this type of fostering was a bit slow down or significantly slowing down, I would say, during the war time. Uh, because you need to keep contact with parents, you need and children and people and families are moving. So this was the most also difficult to manage in terms of keeping contact with families, moving to several locations, connecting and agreeing this with the biological families. So this was also one, one of the challenges. Thank you, Vesilina. That's very helpful. I'm going I to- suggest uh, that I would suggest if you keep the chat, I can probably later answer the questions to, perfect. to people. Um, perfect. That, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for doing that, Vesilina. Thank you, Vesilina and Galina. This was really helpful and informative. Clearly, we're just touching. There's a lot more questions and a lot more discussion that are going to happen, but this was a, a really um, helpful introduction. Um, a reminder to colleagues that you also have the jam board where you can be adding comments, uh, thoughts, and uh, recommendations. So please do use the jam board. The link is in the chat. I'm going to hand over now to my wonderful colleague, uh, Kelly Bonkers, to help moderate the second part of this, um, of this learning meeting.
Thank you, Florence, and good morning, good afternoon to all of you. I'm Kelly Bunkers. I'm with Maestral International and Changing the Way We Care and delighted to um, be part of this fascinating webinar today. Session two, we are going to hear from three different representatives of organizations that are engaged in supporting Ukrainian refugee children and foster care in three host countries, including Poland, Moldova, and Romania. So as with our first session, we are looking forward to a lot of information and a little amount of time. So please do use the Jamboard to write challenges, recommendations of what you're hearing, as well as writing questions in the chat. We will have some time at the end to discuss both of those. Uh, so our first presenter, I'm delighted to introduce Beata Kulig, who is a representative of the Polish Foster Care Coalition. Beata, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Beata Kulik, and uh, I, mm, I'm here as Polish Foster Care Coalition representative. Polish Foster Care Coalition is a network, network organization. Uh, we are focused mostly on advocacy, on a child rights to grow up in a family. Whenever it's not possible in the biological family, uh, it should be possible in a mm, foster family. Um, for a daily basis, I work for SS Children's Villages Poland, and I represent this organization to Polish Foster Care Coalition. And Polish Foster Care Coalition is also a member organization of Eurochild. So this is about me and the organization I am, uh, I am from. And please, next slide. Here you see a lot of numbers. And uh, please just focus uh, uh, your attention to the two most important. It's about a number of you people from Ukraine who come to Poland since February 24 uh, this year, which means it's almost 6 million people. But it's also almost 4 million people of people, uh, Ukrainian, uh, who come from Poland to Ukraine. Some of them, they are commuters. They come here and there. But uh, you see this is a huge a movement of people around um, my country. But when we look at the number of those who uh, would like to stay in Poland for some period short or, or, or midterm, it's uh, 1 million uh, two, uh, 200 uh, thousand uh, person. And out, out of that, it's uh, 180 uh, 80,000 um, <clears throat> children enrolled to Polish schools. This is an official statistics. And what is good to have in mind, that those statistics are quite well monitored. But when we talk about statistic, uh, statistics regarding alternative care, we are not so sure as here uh, about numbers. Why I will share with you in the uh, next slides. Here we have this, could we, could we just go back to the previous slides just for a while? Here you have a number of laws and policies that are, um, that are binding in that situation of the refugee income to Poland. But those uh, two I would like to focus the most in that presentation are the act on family strengthening and alternative care uh, system in Poland. And the other one, the uh, act on assistance for Ukrainian citizens who come to Poland in connection with the armed conflict. Uh, in the territory of, um, of the Ukraine. So this is the two acts we will be focused on during that presentation. So please, next slide. Uh, here is a brief introduction, what would be the main points. So please, next slide. Um, when we are talking about uh, alternative uh, care in Poland, this is a really brief, brief, brief introduction to the system that is binding in my country. So we have two different types of um, alternative care. It's a family foster care uh, and the institutional care. When we talk about family care, foster care, this is a kinship 
foster family. This means that children are placed in the families of their grandparents or in the families of their siblings. This, um, uh, this um, kinship um, foster family do not require any type of preparation. But on the other hand, this is the majority of family foster care in Poland. So when we think about the other types, we have non-professional foster parents, which means that those people are trained to become a foster parent, but they are not paid for do so. They receive only allowances for child needs. And we have a professional foster family, professional foster pa family, those people who are candidates to become a professional foster families, they receive quite comprehensive trainings, they receive allowances for children, and they receive salary. And we have a, let's say so, meaning by meaning, so it's multi-children foster family, but if I translate it like a word one-to-one, uh, -one, it's like a family type foster uh, child home or something like that. It's, and this operates up to eight children. It also means that those people who run, run this multi-children foster family are well-trained, they receive salaries and they are, receive allowances for children. And we have institutional care. There is a number of different types of residential facilities. And those residential facilities should be no bigger than for 14 children. We have also institutions for newborns and infants, and they are called pre-adoptive centers. There are not so many in the country, like free, free, free like those institutions are in Poland. And we have institutions for children with special needs, which means it's up to 45 children. Those two, uh, pre-adoptive centers and regional care therapeutic centers are concerned of United Nations Child Red Committee of, um, simply institutionalization of children, especially such young children as newborns and infants in a pure institutional environments. And Poland is called to uh, close down this kind of solution. However, nothing is happening in terms of any amendments in, in Poland. So, but coming back to the situation uh, related to uh, war in Ukraine and influx of um, refugees from Ukraine to Poland, a Polish state operates a hub in Stalowa Wola uh, dedicated for Ukrainian children who come to Poland on their own, which means um, children over 16 years old and under the legal age, uh, which in Poland is 18. This is because of differences, the law differences between Poland and Ukraine, uh, whereas in Poland, uh, this legal age is simply higher, which means 18, those people were somehow uh, welcomed in this hub in Stalowa and former um, steps for them, former places for them was looked for. And also in this hub in Stalowa there should be registered all children who come to Poland with groups, uh, in groups with caregivers from any type of out of home care from Ukraine. However, it's uh, the system is not so strict. There were a number of groups from Ukraine, especially in the very beginning, in, in late February, mid March, by mid March, that just go through Poland, go to Germany, Belgium, Finland, and nobody counted those groups. So this is really a question mark, where the children are, what has happened, is Poland, is any other EU country may track uh, what has happened to those children. So this is a question mark. But when we think about what we have in Poland after March, uh, when the, the bill was uh, adopted, it's the temporary guardianship. It means that each and every child who come to Poland without a legal guardian, according to Polish law, should uh, obtain a temporary guardian, which means usually children who come to Poland with relatives or with someone from the neighborhood. 
And this is the majority of those who become uh, temporary guardians. It means uh, generally grandparents, aunts, and someone from the extended family of children. So this is the number 25,000. It's not so high as we take into consideration the number of people who come to Poland and applied for the short or mid-term stay in the country. So please, next slide. Uh, this is about challenges. Uh, I believe that if only you have questions, you can ask me because there's uh, not a lot of time and we are rather focused on alternative care. So please, next slide. Uh, when we think about monitoring children who come to Poland from out of home care, uh, uncompanied asylum seekers children, but also those who come to Poland without legal guardian, there is stipulated that should be introduced a register for minors. And each as, and every such a child should be registered there. But there were a lot of delays in introducing those uh, software simply. And on the other hand, there's also a weak communication between courts, social services, temporary guardians, possible shortage of Polish social staff that is uh, in charge of uh, filling in the register. So still the data we will receive. It might be a lot of gaps and really it needs a more monitor to, um, to monitor where the gaps are, what are uh, not put into the register, why, and so on. So, so the register hasn't started binding by uh, hold it by, 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 by July. So it, you see the, 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 the number of uh, months without the register. But when we think about children from out of home, according to Polish Ministry of uh, Family and Social Policy, it means just 2,000 children, whereas only 74 children are placed in Polish alternative care. So you see that the number are very small because <coughs> Why? Because the majority of children who come to Poland from Ukraine with foster families, they are in, not in that number, <coughs> or some of them, they are not in that number, as I said, that this, the, 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 the registers, the, the, the monitoring of data is not very comprehensive. And the other thing is that the 74 uh, children placed in residential care, are, in majority, are those uncompanied teenagers. So this is the majority of the picture. And now a few words about standards of um, uh, facilities or foster care or residential care for Ukrainian children and for Polish children, how it operates. First of all, because, I mean, this, um, this act uh, dedicated to support Ukrainian uh, citizens makes uh, Polish standards uh, less um, uh, um, less high. I mean, it was easing the standards that are binding for each uh, for uh, for each and every child in Poland, both Ukrainian and non-Ukraine uh, and Polish ones, or just generally all children in Poland. So the number of children per institution is uh, there is no limits anymore. There is no limits of. Uh, age of children placed to institutional care, by now it was 10 years. Now it's no, like no uh, age limits to um, putting children in institutional care. So um, when we think about the quality of caregivers from Ukraine hired to Polish institutions, it's also the question of the um, ability to monitoring the quality. Uh, so this is the question, whether we can monitor the standard. And if we ask who can be a foster parent for Ukrainian children, or who could be a foster parent in Poland? So generally, the, the path is the, sa is the same. However, the Ukrainian citizens who would like to act as a foster parents for Ukrainian children has a really short, let's say short, um, short path it's uh, really the standards are easy. So they first receive a child because ordered by court and then have a half of the year to 
um, obtain required courses and qualifications, which means that it may happen that the they have a child at home and they will not finish courses. And because of some reasons, they won't be qualified as a person who should be a foster parent. So it's in Poland by now, it is um, used only for children uh, uh, from the kinship care. And it's a very run, a very, very seldom solution, but now it's open for Ukrainian children. So the question is, if we have two different ways, like two different standards, it's one question. And the other question is whether those really not high number of children really requires different standards. So this is a list of challenges. Uh, for sure, I do not cover all the issues. It should be like, you know, much more time for that. It's just a first thought, first, um, like say, first uh, reflections uh, over the monitoring very um, few months of uh, binding the, 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 the newly introducing standards. Uh, so, what I would like to focus from my experience of those who, who, who provide mm. uh, provide help, direct help also, is to monitor standard, but also to have in mind that we have, even though Poland and Ukraine is very close, we have very similar culture, but it's not the same. The system in Ukraine and system in Poland is not the same, and to avoid potential uh, tensions between, for example, Polish services, social services and Ukrainian fa foster families that are recognized in Poland as a foster families, it should be really a good preparation of uh, Polish social services of those uh, differences, because we for <clears throat> sure we have much more strict and monitor system. Uh, and thank this you. Is one thing that I, I, I could recommend to, to keep Excellent. in mind that there are those two different systems. But yes, it's very thank you. Very thank you, Beata. I thank you so much. And we know there's so much to talk about and really appreciate um, just your sharing and, and trying to keep on time. So huge thanks. I think there there were a couple of questions. One question um that maybe you could answer written in the chat so that we can move forward with our next presenter but huge thanks Beata for that really comprehensive presentations and once again we will be sharing recordings uh, of this webinar and the presentation so you'll be able to dig into a lot of those numbers that we saw in the presentation and now our second presenter is Daniela Mamaliga from Partnership for Every Child in Moldova who's going to give us an overview of foster care for refugee children in Moldova thank you and welcome Daniela Thank you, Kelly, uh, and thank you for, for this great opportunity to share our experience and to meet old friends and colleagues as well. Um, as it was, was, uh, it was already mentioned, the war in uh, Ukraine uh, has a devastating impact on children and their families, and uh, Moldova, as a neighbor country, tried to do her best in supporting families and children on MOVE. Since February 24, over 590,000 persons have entered Moldova and 90,000 of them have stayed in the country. Over 42,000 of those who stayed are children. Uh, most refugees are hosted in communities and only four or five percentages are accommodated in refugee accommodation centers. I have to say that there are no data on unaccompanied or separated children placed in residential care, particularly uh, uh, institutions run by, by churches or international NGOs. The initial expectation on uh, a large number of, uh, of uh, unaccompanied or separated children in need of protection 
under the international practice, uh, uh, about 2% out of the total number of children have not been confirmed. Uh, there is no data to prove this uh, estimate in Moldova as, uh, yet. So most of the identified children were unaccompanied and separated were over 16 because the Ukraine legislation allowed their movement across the border. Uh, starting with uh, April, child protection specialists uh, were appointed at the border crossing points as part of the blue dot teams, and all the cases started to be registered. Uh, we aim to, to ensure the safety of all children. At the moment, uh, government together with UN agencies and other development partners are working on uh, development of uh, an identification uh, and referral mechanism and a database in order to collect uh, um, uh, data across the country because most of, of uh, uh, as I mentioned, most of the children uh, are in uh, communities. Um, as a part of uh, immediate, next uh, slide, please. As a part of uh, immediate and uh, ongoing response, various uh, uh, types of support and services were established and provided to families and children on movement and uh, for those staying in communities such uh, as Blue Dots, with child and youth friendly spaces, mother and baby corners, psychosocial support and legal advice, medical first aid and so on. In terms of the legislation, I have to underline that there was no need to make critical revisions uh, in, in the legal framework as uh, we have a law on special protection of children uh, at risk and children separated from their parents that was uh, adjusted uh, in line with UN guidelines uh, on alternative care. Uh, that allows the authorities to respond and provide appropriate support, including to refugee children. So under this law, children at risk or separated from their parents are entitled to protection with no discrimination based on citizenship, parents or legal rep uh, representatives, place of uh, residence and so on. Consequ consequently, if a child is identified at risk in any districts of the country, regardless of the origin or citizenship, they fall under the incidence of, uh, of the Moldovan legislation. Um, as new, new regulations that were approved, I would mention regulation on the establishment of the interagency cooperation mechanism for the identification assistance and monitoring of children in crisis situation coming from Ukraine that stipulates clear duties of the authorities uh, involved in, in, in the support, border police, national bureau of migration, ministry of labor and social protection, local authorities and NGOs. At the same time, um, uh, uh, in line with this regulation, um, uh, the territorial social assistance structures were requested to assign child protection specialists to be deployed at the border crossing points and provide assistance to children at risk coming from Ukraine. The case management remained the same, is applied under the existing framework. Only the initial child, child assessment form was adjusted and approved by the Ministry of of labor and social protection and is used uh, at the border crossing points by child protection uh, specialists. Next slide, please. Um, you know that to um, provide appropriate support to and family care to children, to especially for children unaccompanied uh, and, separated, uh, and separated children, the government uh, decided to, uh, together with development partners, uh, of course, decided to strengthen um, existing uh, in-country family type alternative care arrangements, uh, such as foster care and family type home. And uh, just very few about foster care in Moldova. Uh, uh, the, uh, the service has over 20 years of development. Uh, and is a leading alternative family type service in country. It is widely used in, and available for children separated from biological family uh, and children placed in residential care across the country. The service is, regula is regulated by the government and uh, at the moment we have uh, 446 foster cares with uh, more than um, uh, 1,000 children in placement. 
the service beneficiaries is any child that uh, in a risk situation uh, uh, that is temporary or per uh, permanently deprived uh, of a family environment due to different reasons. There are regulated four type of placement, long-term, short-term, emergency and short break. I, uh, and I would mention that uh, uh, in, um, in case of, uh, of refugee children it is applied, especially for, uh, for, for the beginning emergency placement. And the legal basis and the process for placement is quite complex and decision is made by the guardianship authority, but based on the, uh, on the uh, notification paper for, for the approval by issued by the gatekeeping commission. Uh, next slide, please. So, as I mentioned earlier, to avoid institutionalization of, uh, of children, uh, a government decision was to strengthen uh, existing family type alternative care uh, and actions that were required uh, to carry out immediate, immediately in order to be able to receive children in placement were uh, to carry out analysis of the legal framework, methodology and service procedures, um, adjust and revise if needed, to identify foster cares, educators from family type home uh, available to receive children in placement across the country, to develop a capacity building plan, particularly focused on, on uh, trauma informed, uh, and provide ongoing support to all stake, uh, stakeholders involved, particularly children and uh, foster care. Next slide, please. What we managed to realize starting with um, end of April, where a national rapid assessment was conducted uh, across the country that revealed the limited capacity of local public authorities to provide foster care services for refugee children uh, due to um, uh, human and financial lack of uh, human and financial resources. Uh, only nine out of 35 districts were identified as available to receive children in placement, and the decision was uh, uh, taken to select three districts from north, south, and south of country uh, to deliver foster care services for, for unaccompanied and separated children. Uh, we've managed to assign agreements um, uh, that stipulates allocation and employment of uh, 30 foster families uh, for at least 60 uh, to accommodate at least 60 uh, children. Uh, a contingency plan to increase this number in case if needed is under development, uh, a development including a plan for extension uh, in other districts. Uh, the analysis of legal framework uh, has shown that there is no need of revisions. Similar system and criteria can be applied for foster care placement of refugee children as for children uh, who um, are nationals. Next slide, please. In parallel with uh, all this work, a capacity building plan um, was developed. So we, uh, with uh, changing the way we, we care initiative and uh, UNICEF support, a training program uh, on psycho uh, psychological first aid uh, was designed, aiming to build the knowledge uh, and skills of foster care teams and foster cares. Uh, a two-day training of trainers on the psychosocial first aid was delivered to 30 ch child protection specialists responsible for foster care teams from 30 districts and two municipalities, and one-day training for about 60, fo uh, 60 foster cares from three selected districts was delivered. At the moment, we have four children placed in foster care, uh, two uh, 16, year, uh, 16 years uh, old uh, teenagers and one young mother and uh, her ba uh, baby. Very brief key issues we encounter uh, were connections with guardianship authority from Ukraine. And I think the, uh, uh, I think Vasilina proposals to allocate a case manager for children in host ca countries is great and we have to see how we can do this. Um, next slide, please. Uh, as um, uh, regarding challenges of future step, I, I would like to underline that in general, the difficulties uh, facing the foster care uh, now are no different from those before the refugee crisis. 
uh, this are the same systemic pro problems that in the context of the crisis actually become more preeminent. And here we are talking about the financing of the service, the commitment uh, of the local and national authorities regarding the development of the service, the capacity of uh, human resources to recruit, assess, support and monitor, uh, the attitude of professionals and society towards the needs to raise, uh, to, to raise children in family environment and uh, there are still uh, I have to mention that uh, even the, the uh, services widely used across the country, there are still discrepancies uh, in service development uh, across the country. And uh, uh, the number of foster care varies from one, two per district to 40, for example. Uh, the most marginalized children um, are children with severe disabilities, with complex uh, emotional needs, babies, uh, and they are not still covered by the service. Um, in residential institutions, we still have uh, children uh, up to 1,000 children at the moment, and the majority are this group of children that are not covered. We have stigma towards uh, Roma children, uh, children with disability or children with complex emotional needs, particularly those aged 14, 18 persist uh, in society. Uh, there is a lack of financial resources, as I mentioned, to meet the current needs, needs of foster care service. There is a tendency at the moment uh, related to inflation and uh, uh, we have at the moment, uh, there is a tendency of decreasing in number of foster care due to low salaries and lack of motivation. And we believe that by solving all these problems, the needs of the refugee children will also be, be covered. Uh, the government plans established together with national, uh, with national uh, civil society and development partners for the immediate next stage aim to strengthen the foster care service. Uh, and that includes the integration of foster care in the minimum package of services to be financed from the national budget, the revision of the legislation to increase salaries of foster care and child allowances, strengthening the work, workforce uh, by establishing a clear initial and the in-service training mechanism, strengthening the uh, supervision system, revision the legislation to regulate foster care as a, mand a mandatory service uh, for local public authorities. So our hope is that uh, all these plans will be implemented and we will meet uh, uh, the needs uh, of all children, including children um, unaccompanied or separated uh, coming from Ukraine. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you so much. And please do write your questions in the chat. We will have some time afterwards and I've been collecting them and I see people are using the jam boards. Huge thanks, Daniela. I'm hearing some, some common themes that we can perhaps discuss in the chat. And now our third and final presenter, I'd like to introduce Judith Christian from Hope and Homes for Children, who will be presenting about the situation in Romania. Thank you, Judith. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad to be here in your company and hopefully my presentation not being only the last but maybe a little bit different because we concentrated in presenting the foster care system in Romania within the context of Ukrainian crisis. But first of all, let me present uh, sorry. Uh, let me present Hope and Homes for you, because Hope and Homes for Children aims to make orphanages history by reforming national child care system and promoting alternative family-based care. We strive to place children with loving families, whether they are birth families or foster families. We also promote fostering, support foster networks and encourage state authorities to develop them. Uh, starting my um, uh, presentation, I would love also to make a quote from uh, one of our colleagues that lives in Siget, the border city. Uh, if I'm allowed, I will quote what she said on the after the 24th of February. She says, she said that nobody believed me, our colleague from Siga says, but on the morning of the 24th of February, I got my car into my car and drive to Bayamare. I saw the biggest flock of black crows coming, flying across the border. She said a thousand, tens of thousands of crows seemed for her in that morning. Then she got back to Siget after she drove to Bayamare and she bought a lot of bottles of water puffies 
and she continued. She went to the border. Then, in the very first day, I did not know what to help, what to do to help better. These are her words, and and they remind in my mind because they were so. Um, um, telling everything what was going on at the border. And you have here now the picture of a group of children coming from an institution from Ukraine that came through the border and they are placed now in a Romanian residential unit. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, I would start with some of the official figures that we have about the situation of uh, children in uh, refugees in Romania now with the Ukraine crisis. And uh, um, the UN High Commissioner stated that 1,200,945 Ukrainians crossed the border to Romania since the beginning in February till August. Um, sorry, June. Uh, then 83,708 of the Ukrainian refugees remained in Romania. And from this number, a number of 37,000 children, refugee children are still in Romania. Some of them, most of them, I think uh, they are accompanied by parents, relatives, or other, other um, um, representative, family representatives. And only 220 Ukrainian children are receiving all available services for the children in care in Romanian system. These are the figures uh, we could find also um, in, in the statistics uh, offered by the Child Protection Authority. The legal framework in Romania, um, uh the legal revision uh, was to adapt and to apply to any of and all the children staying are applying the, so the legal provision is applying to all the children staying living or residing in romania including in this all domestic and tradition and transfugee uh, and refugee children the legal procedures between romania and ukrainian authorities uh, are regarding entering the country by romanian uh, by ukrainian nationals and also one of the legal framework that was put in place in Romania, an operative group for unattended children has been developed and it's running on and at each of the 47 countries level, uh, at county levels in Romania. So at uh, the child protection system has put in place those measures and, and um, uh, tools that can actually help in understanding, finding, assessing and intervening, offering, offering protection for the children um, that are in Romania now, uh, children from Ukraine. Um, so the... Um, Child Protection National Authority requested in February from every country, from every county directorate, so the county level child children rights protection authority, an updated situation on available services for children in under in order to have a situation where to find appropriate services for every Ukrainian child in need that is crossing the border. Uh, and since then, a cooperation between Romanian authorities regarding entering the country by Ukrainian and regarding registration, transiting settlement, and ensuring protection of unattended children rights, children that are coming from war conflict areas in Ukraine. Um, next slide, please. The figures regarding the special protection, so-called special protection, which actually provides uh, protection for the children rights or any kind of child in Romania, no matter if it is Romanian or any other uh, um, um, nationality. Uh, starting from 2004, when the legal when the legal basis was put in place, the actual the law that we are using today was put in place in 2004. We had a more than 82,000 children in, in uh, special protection, so in care. Uh, we are talking about residential care for 32,000, more than for 32,000, foster care 15,800, and in kinship care 34,000. If you are going through the numbers, we we'll see that uh, on March of 22 this year, so we have 44,000 children remained in care in special protection. In residential units, we have 12,700 more than. Uh, we are talking about all kinds of residential type of units. Um, 
Then in foster care, we have 17,000 children, more than 17,000. I wanted to show you these numbers, these figures, because it shows that the tendency obviously is uh, towards uh, family-based care and the foster care uh, more than any kind of other uh, special protection um, offer for the children, put in place for the children in Romania. Next slide, please. The types of foster care in Romania um, are different for uh, the children, especially for those children of different age. So we have a generic foster care for specific age groups from 0 to 18 years old. We have then foster cares prepared for children with disabilities. We have foster cares prepared for children who are victims of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. We have foster care specially prepared for emergency placement. And then we have also a foster care um, training made for those foster cares who are receiving care, children with, with HIV or AIDS. Um, thank you. So the foster care in Romania, uh, I would emphasize, uh, I would remain on this question, who can be a foster care? Because basically, uh, since 1998, foster care is a fully recognized profession in Romania. So people are actually applying, they are assessed, trained, monitored, they are also um, receiving a... Um, um, something like a diploma, sorry for my... Um, and then can then can be hired by the state authorities to become to, to having care children. Um, so the foster care children are receiving a salary and they receive all the allowances and the benefits that are, pro that are provided for the children in care. The process of recruiting, training, certifying, and monitoring the foster carers in Romania is regulated by the child protection legislation. Um, there are standards and professional standards. Okay, which child are, sorry, can we go back for a while? Which children are available to be placed in foster care? Uh, basically, any child that um, is in care and the age of the child permits the child wants to um, live in a family, he can be placed in foster care, the age, of the children who must be put in care and the foster care, the foster care system is, is better for them, is appropriate, is the age of seven under the law. Okay. I would go further. The two, two minutes, you did. Thank you. Thank you. The challenges that we face, uh, we face in Romania, and we are still trying to uh, find the best solutions for the children coming into Romania and needing of care, like foster care, is the numbers of available foster carers. It is estimated that up to 10% of the foster cares in border countries, counties of Romania with Ukraine, are Ukrainian native speakers. These are the figures that we found out from our colleagues working in, in the child protection system. Uh, there were challenges, of course, as my previous colleagues uh, presented with, regarding cultural language barriers and social differences. Education and school status for refugee children from UK because until the end of the last school year, they were only attending, auditing the courses. Starting from this um, new school year since uh, September 5th, they are becoming students and they can be registered. Um, challenges regarding services, benefits and support were also um, overcome and we'll try to find solutions for these kind of challenges. We can go further. The steps taken. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So groups of children in care accompanied by their carers from Ukraine residential units receive special protection in Romania in several countries. Uh, Romania has amended this legal framework regarding education to accommodate refugees according to with the EU set of recommendations and the statement regarding the integration of children 
in education in European countries, and the methodology was put in place to request international protection or subsidiary protection in order to receive state benefits and, uh, for accompanied refugee children. One of our recommendations would be especially for facilitating foster care for Ukrainian nationals. We can go further. These are only some of the pictures that um, during summer camps that we provided for uh, Ukrainian children were put in place. And last. Next slide, please. I want to present you the prime role, Primero. It is a um, open source software developed by the National Authority for the Protection of the Right of the Child and Adoption in partnership with UNICEF for registering, tracing, and monitoring refugee children in Romania. Uh, I would add that since August, when this was developed, in the first week, 830 children were identified in Romania. Ukrainian children were identified. So we are still going on. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for your attention and your Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you, Judith. This is great. And we do have some time. First of all, before we jump into questions, just a round of applause and thanks to all of our presenters. Thank you very much. As Florence said in the very beginning, this is really um, the first step in what we see as probably a series of longer discussions about this topic. But this is just to, very helpful to give us all um, an idea of what's happening both in U the Ukraine and in these three host countries. I was looking at the chat and wanted to start with a question uh, that Eileen had, and she mentioned that um, Rosalina had said th about the importance of um, having a case manager connected with children who are outside of Ukraine in, in some of these countries. And I would just like to ask our three presenters, are is that happening in any of your contexts? Are you facilitating that? Or if not, what kind of steps might be taken to make sure that for children cared for in your context, they are somehow connected with a caseworker in Ukraine. Anyone like to take a first stab at that question? Don't be shy. <laughs> and it's okay I, to I say start. if it's not. Okay, Beata, thank start, you. I can start, but I have not a lot of experience. However, SS Children's Villages Poland supports many foster families from Ukraine and also hosts about 200 people from Ukraine, mainly foster families. And Polish Foster Care Coalition, also a member organization, uh, hosts and supports uh, foster families from Ukraine. So, uh, unfortunately, we have not really experience with connecting uh, families with social workers from Ukraine. In SOS Children's Villages, the situation is a bit different because as the organization that operates in Poland and in Ukraine, we simply hire in Poland social workers from Ukraine to support those foster families, but they are uh, but they are simply hired by SOS here in Poland. Uh, other, I may say that there is a kind of, uh, there are kind of ties between uh, foster families from Ukraine and social workers from Ukraine there in Ukraine, because those fam so, uh, foster families from Ukraine, they receive allowances and kind of subsidies from Ukraine while they stay in Poland. And they are in touch with authorities from Ukraine in one time. But on the other hand, this is a kind of, let's say, a duplication of system. If each of those foster families from Ukraine become recognized uh, as a foster family in Poland based on Polish law and is entitled, entitled to receive re, um, allowances from Polish state. So this is rather a question mark, how to solve that, let's say, double obligation, especially that those systems are not um, like one-to-one. -one. 
they differ much uh, as Vaslina says and I, if I have ability to tell more, more about the system organized in Poland so we will have like two different expectations from two different social workers if a foster family become recognized the Ukrainian one become recognized as a foster family in Poland and I think, I mean, it might be difficult. There are just few such cases that Ukrainian foster families who come to Poland were um, apply for being recognized uh, by Polish court, uh, by Polish authority as a foster family based on Polish uh, law. Great. In the majority of those, uh, first, I mean, general majority of foster families that are hosted here in Poland by different organizations, they are simply a kind of guests in, in my country that receive mm -hmm. um, this PESEL number, which is a registration number. They receive a, some subsidies that are um, each and every a family with children in Poland is entitled to, but they okay. are not recognized as a foster as family foster in family. terms of Polish le legislation. Okay. They and do you children, know? They, they, they are temporary guardians. They are in, in relations with the people, who, I mean, social services from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. But here in Poland, they are just recognized as any other refugee with the children. Great. who has a temporary guardianship over children. So okay, this is excellent. Our experience in maternity. Thank you. Thank you, Beata. Very helpful. Daniela or Judith, I don't know if you have anything to add to that from your context. If not, Daniela or Judith, yeah? Mm. It's very difficult to find an answer because in our case, children come from areas that are affected by war. So it's very difficult to establish this connection with uh, with uh, Ukrainian authorities. So yeah. yes, it, it is key from my personal view to maintain this connection, to establish this connection, but it's very difficult to find ways, solutions. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, thank you, Selena. We're looking at some of the recommendations and solutions that people have um, suggested. So I'll give you just a few minutes to just look over these and our presenters feel free to comment on any of these. Um, emergency foster care placement. I'm also wondering if, um, I know from conversations with colleagues in many of these countries, because of the current um, price hikes of everything, the energy crisis and pending winter, I know that um, foster families who, who are just part of um, the child protection system, not necessarily specialized to care for, um, Ukrainian refugee children. I know that we're struggling, organizations are struggling to keep them because of the existing stipends just aren't enough to cover prices. So I'm, I'm also wondering, are there advocacy efforts in the countries where you work to, to address this and to really lobby and make a case for increased funding so that we can maintain the families we have and recruit new ones. Anything happening, Bayata, Judith, or Daniela, in terms of advocating for increases to address the economic crisis? Okay, I can share it briefly, because now in Polish Parliament, it's pending an um, amendment of the bill of the alternative care, uh, family support and alternative care. Uh, mm -hmm. The works has started even before the, the war and the crisis. Uh, this allowances and the income of uh, foster families is really very low and yeah. even uh, uh, so we do a lot of work 
advocacy, but it's still uh, the money spent it for residential or institutional care uh, four or sometimes five times higher per child than for a child in foster family. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just three times higher and um, it's also depends. I mean, in Poland, it's different very much because it's, uh, the central government gives just the framework, but it's mm -hmm. 380 local authorities responsible for uh, building up a local system. So there are very, um, the places, the local authorities, uh, where the, it works, uh, operates quite well, and majority that uh, faces a crisis in terms of number of foster parents, but uh, in the same time, uh, they spend quite a high money for uh, institutional care. Yeah. So this is, yeah. I think it's the reality of many countries, yeah. unfortunately. Thanks, Beata. So Selena has mentioned in the chat, uh, we are able to unmute if anyone would like to comment on a recommendation or ask a question. Please do feel free to unmute yourself before we head into conclusions. Any, any thoughts on these recommendations in terms of prioritizing, anything that's missing? or any questions? Seems there's a lot to take in. Great. Florence, I think I will turn it over to you um to sort of uh yeah conclude and wrap up and talk about potential next steps thank you kelly um i see that there's still a couple of questions in the in the chat but i think um we probably have reached saturation in terms of information as well uh it was incredibly rich um as we thought it would be and uh, really important learning some of the uh, actually if you can still spot the uh, the jam board i think it'd be quite helpful um uh, to stick to to some of the comments because some of them uh were extremely helpful um we we clearly heard uh, a number of things one i guess the good news which is that still a lot of the children uh um in ukraine uh, continue to be uh placed in in kinship or placed in extended family care uh, which is good news uh, but we also heard of a uh, a system uh, that is, um, you know, being pushed into uh, um, different alternatives, including foster care, um, and that is facing some some significant challenges in terms of resources, in terms of uh, ensuring that support is provided uh, um, for different types of uh, both kins and non kins foster care, um, and. Uh, um, the the uh, my understanding uh, and correct me the city and Galina if it's not correct but is that there's also quite creative uh, uh, work happening in terms of um, overcoming the the legal uh, challenge to placing a child in in temporary foster care particularly emergency foster care by not applying uh, the the current regulation but it seems that uh, emergency foster care remains a very limited option. And there's a need to uh, strengthen uh, uh, the ability of uh, and the delivery of uh, um, temporary foster care as well, as well as supporting kins families to have the resource uh, uh, that they need to, to care for those children. Um, if you can go back to the, um, uh, the first page of the jam board, Selena. Thank you. So some of the challenges that were identified um, had to do with this question of financial support uh, and also the lack of uh, limited number of social workers and the capacity uh, among the social work system to actually address the demand and to do proper assessment and placements. Um, and some of the recommendations clearly are 
the need for greater investment in uh, uh, in developing the foster care system, but also developing the social workforce in terms of their ability to both support, um, assess placements, um, and also uh, enable the monitoring of the placement. Um, Galina uh, referred to an initiative to have a strategy, if I remember well, it's, it's uh, the development of the Ministry of Social Policy of a strategy for Ukraine or a plan around the development of the foster care system. And I think one of the, and that was reinforced as well, I think by, by um, Vasilinia in terms of what's needed. So getting a greater clarity in relation to the, the, uh, uh, the strategy for addressing the longer term needs for foster care in Ukraine and the different types of foster care, um, I think was one of the, the main recommendations come, coming out of it. Some of the recommendation in relation to the policy was removing the roadblocks. We're still seeing children placed in institutional care that could be placed in foster families. So recognizing as part of the strategy, what are those roadblocks? What are those challenges and how they can be removed? Uh, the, the question around strengthening the mechanism for supervision and monitoring the, the situation for the, ch the children that are placed, both in kin's families where support needs are needed, but also in uh, these foster families. And, and ensuring that uh, uh, those mechanisms for, for monitoring extend not just to Ukraine, but actually across countries. So that was one of the question that we were addressing, which is to what extent are children that are displaced uh, to uh, host countries and placed in foster families or in kin families or in residential care in those host countries, to what extent there is coordination between the social workers, both uh, in Ukraine um, and in those host countries. And it sounds that, that this is still not really happening. And this is one of the major challenges that uh, needs to be addressed. Um, so it's also related to the coordination between uh, uh, Ukraine and the host countries uh, and the social ministries and, and uh, the service providers agencies. One of the challenges for Ukraine that was identified, and actually not just in Ukraine, in Poland, I think as well in other countries, was the fact that responsibility for child protection continues to be quite divided between different ministries. Um, and therefore, uh, in relation to the response and the strategy uh, for placement of children who need alternative care, you might actually get two different things. I think it was Beata that mentions that you still have um, you know, the, the, the principle that children should be placed in families, but the resources continue to be really placed into and focused on residential care. So the strategies clearly for ensuring that children remain in, in, in family care uh, um, require also addressing um, those, those parallel systems and ensuring that um, they are coordinated, coordinated under one coordinated agency rather than under separate ministries that might be actually saying different things and supported different things. One aspect that was touched on, uh, but maybe still relatively uh, you know, light in terms of the information was related to the situation of children with disabilities. And in particular, uh, as we know uh, that many children with disabilities were placed in residential care uh, in uh, Ukraine, many were moved, uh, some were not, some remain in institutional care. So to what extent uh, is the, the uh, strategy for strengthening foster care, both in Ukraine, but also for children that have been uh, displaced in host countries are actually addressing the very specific needs of those children. Are there specialized foster care uh, uh, placements uh, where foster families are receiving uh, the support that they need, including the training that they need, but also the access to the services that children with disabilities actually need in the communities. Is that actually happening? Uh, uh, one of the comments there is family support for uh, um, social workers, so social workers working to strengthen families. Uh, uh, they're needed to uh, ensure that foster carers are able to provide rehabilitative services. So this question of specific needs uh, and ensuring that children with disabilities are placed in families and not just relegated to residential care. One thing that struck me, uh, and again, uh, the, the, the conversation was very rich, but one thing that struck me is that we are actually getting better clarity in terms of the situation, both of the foster care system, clearly today has really helped for that, but also in terms of numbers. Although one thing that was uh, common across uh, all of the presenter was that there still seemed to be a big gap as far as certain population. The data was available either pre-conflict uh, for the general population 
or it is available uh, uh, for a specific, uh, for example, children who were moved from residential care and moved to residential care, but doesn't actually address uh, children that are actually in family-based care in host countries, for example. So they seem to be still relatively uh, uh, big challenges in terms of tracking and understanding the movement of children. Um, as Beata said, in Poland also, uh, while the systems were established, uh, there were definitely periods of time the system for tracking the movement of children, including out of host countries, where those systems were not in place. So there's a big question as well for the children that went through these countries, uh, but then they were relocated to other countries. So we're, we're getting a better picture of the, thanks to you, and thanks to our presenters, we're getting a better picture, but it's still a very fragmented picture. Um, and uh, the aim of this uh, beginning conversation was how do we reinforce that? Well, one thing was the presentation uh, that we heard today, the presentations we heard today. The other thing is maybe pulling together that picture, that information around uh, the current situation of the foster care system, both in Ukraine um, and in the neighboring countries, and developing a clearer picture of the strategies for addressing the situation of children in foster care. Uh, in these countries, both in terms of Ukraine itself, but also in terms of coordination. So in other words, that if the goal is to ensure that children uh, that are uh, uh, in need of alternative care in Ukraine and in, in host countries get the support that they need in families, then we need a much greater strategy that, uh, um, that links better the situation of the children that remain in Ukraine and the situation of children that are in host countries. So one of our one of our hope out of this, beyond sharing this incredible learning and, and very rich information, and clearly we all are going to need to go back to the presentation and to the presenter for further information, is if we can bring together that picture uh, and, and then move the conversation uh, uh, and, and build on what Galina and uh, Veselina said in terms of the strategy in Ukraine, but also what Danelia, what Berta and uh, Judith said in terms of those countries, what is the strategy for ensuring that uh, uh, you know, Ukrainian children actually access family-based alternative care, for ensuring that these children are not placed in residential care, and for ensuring that uh, the needed coordination uh, is, is uh, active between the countries with a view of ensuring that children actually have families that can uh, uh, take them where they can be reintegrated, actually have the desired support. So there's much more coordination between the, the social services across these countries. Um, these are just my thought in terms of next step. I mean, clearly uh, uh, we, need to, we need to digest a huge amount of information. Kelly, I don't know whether you wanted to add anything that I've forgotten. I'm sure there's a <laughs> that lot. was extremely comprehensive, Florence. I think that was great. No, I think there's a lot um, that people have shared. I, I'm just rereading as well the jam boards, lots of rich information and um, just a, a critical need, I think, to really come together. And I find these opportunities to share really, really valuable. So um, thanks again. No, that was great, Lauren. Thank you. So again, thank you so much to all our presenters. Thank you to Kelly. Thank you to colleagues. Uh, Selena and uh, uh, Catherine uh, as well for helping uh, facilitate and support this, uh, uh, this event. It's the first step. We are going to come back to you. Uh, we know how incredibly busy, particularly colleagues working in the region, working in Ukraine that are facing uh, extraordinarily complex uh, situation at a time when the conflict is still ongoing uh, and the situation of children and families is still so dire. Um, so we're very grateful uh, for you to take the time. We will still uh, go back to you and ask for uh, working with you and other colleagues on this call to see whether we can pull together uh, 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 this picture for Ukraine and also for the Ukrainian children in the host countries, and also bring all of your comments, your recommendations and your suggestion um, and support. I think one of the key things that we wanted out of this meeting is to make sure that we can support you in the work that the critical work that you're doing together with local partners uh, in those countries to strengthen the system. So to, you know, to the extent that uh, we as a community are able to support, we want to make sure we build on the work that you're doing and the recommendation and the, and the, and the solutions you've identified. 
Um, so we thank you very much and uh, we thank your audience and we will be in touch again and we will be sharing all that, all that rich information. Thank you all.